Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran, ruefully watching your nephew accrue 20 million Spotify streams, or else a scrappy upstart, marveling at pictures of your uncle doing drugs with Dwight Yoakam's road crew in the mid-1990s. This is your show, because ultimately it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the second Friday of October 2022, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Bandzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Morrison who drove a Dodge Spirit with a custom matte paint finish and spinners, and who was always trying to enlist you into his multi-level marketing scheme that involved magazine subscriptions. And old Morrison would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months, but it's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting in a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free. Listeners to the Working Songwriter Podcast can go to Banzoogle. Dot com to try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS, the initials of our show, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, the first Sunday night of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm over on my YouTube channel for Sunday Songs. That's a live stream. I'm live. I'm playing tunes live. I'm taking questions in the live chat. I'm taking requests in the live chat. It's a really fun, really interactive experience. I dare to say that we're building something of a little community over there on Sunday nights, including many people who are listeners of this podcast. So come on over and be a part of it. It's the first Sunday night of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern over on YouTube. Head on over to JoePugMusic.com and click on the live stream tab to set a reminder. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T. R-E-O-N, you search for The Working Songwriter or you search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you certainly don't have to pay for, but that you choose to pay for because you dig the show and because you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month. Uh, If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thank you to everybody who's taken the time and the capital to support the show in that way. If you're not in a place where you can contribute in that way, that's totally fine. You could still help us out for free in a couple of ways. First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store. Or second, you could simply tell a friend about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. I hope you enjoy this week's chat with Jenny. Our guest this week is an indie singer-songwriter who has managed to successfully dip her toe into the world of big league pop and rock. Jenny Owen Youngs grew up in New Jersey, went on to study music composition at SUNY Purchase, 
and then stepped on to the national stage as an artist when she signed to Network Records. She toured that project very hard, appearing on tours with Regina Spector, Against Me, Frank Turner, and the 2013 edition of Chuck Reagan's Revival Tour. Her songs have appeared extensively on television, including shows such as Bojack Horseman, Weeds, Grey's Anatomy, and many others. She has co-written tunes for and with Pitbull, Ingrid Michelson, Dan Wilson, and very notably, she co-wrote Panic at the Disco's 2018 hit, High Hopes, which has since gone five times platinum. NPR once said of her that she's a truly unconventional singer-songwriter who puts on an electrifying performance which evokes everything from 80s pop to a few Ennio Morricone-style spaghetti western guitar licks. I got a chance to catch up with Jenny on the phone a few weeks ago and hear about her musical journey so far. Jenny Owen Youngs, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. You know, getting ready for this interview, I was really struck by what a like wide ranging and eclectic uh, career you've had. I mean, we got a lot to get to today. There's not many people who've, you know, toured with Regina Spector and been on the Revival Tour. There's not a lot of people who have written for Pitbull who also have a podcast about popular uh, TV. So, a <laughs> lot to get to today. Um, can we start by you describing how music first came into your life? What did music look like in your household growing up? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Nobody in my nuclear family was really musically inclined in terms of, you know, playing or performance. Um, but my mom listened to, I guess, what at the time was oldies radio. I don't know uh, if we've, what we've moved on to classify. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, 50s and 60s pop rock as now. Is it like oldies twice removed or something. I think, I think it's still oldies. The only difference now is that Tom Petty is included in it. As right. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Nirvana <laughs> is classic rock. Right. I am uh, deteriorating before your very eyes. Yeah. Headed straight to the grave. Uh, we, we listened to a lot of, a lot of like, uh, a lot of Beach Boys and Beatles and mm. um, later on like U2 somehow became like a very, I don't know what the, exactly the connective tissue is there but like those were those were some bands um that got got a lot of play in the house um and i i do recall that the first maybe and only song because i was a very shy kid that i ever called into the radio station to request was uh something good by uh herman's hermits okay. <laughs> right. fair enough herman's hermits not herman and the hermits uh yes radical uh, yeah, yeah. And then um, when I was like, in junior high, uh, I was playing, you know, flute in band and singing in choir and stuff. And um, my stepsister was uh, dating a guy who worked in a guitar shop and like built guitars oh, wow. uh, in his house. Very cool guy. And um, he graciously uh, decided to show me some chords. And um, then I just started kind of like messing around with uh, friends from school, um, putting together sort of like four piece uh, pop rock uh, goof arounds, yeah. uh, you know, learning like Nirvana songs and Grey Day songs and stuff and onward from there, I guess. It's interesting, though. I, what do you think kind of caught your fancy in a way? I mean, a lot of people grew up listening to the radio and everyone loves music to a certain degree. But why do you think you why do you think you were drawn to it in a way that other people weren't? I think like, uh, I think there's something obviously about melody and harmony that just speaks to all of us and like does something to everyone in different ways, of course. Um, and recently I learned that like there's something really positive about singing, par like uh, for your parasymp parasympathetic, uh, parasympathetic? nervous system yeah i think that's something right. good for your brain and body about singing so i feel like i've, I've always t like had a great time singing so like just the act of participating in music uh was always very pleasurable and then i think uh maybe intellectually and emotionally lyric 
the pursuit of lyric is really like the thing I think that like pulled me over the edge into like, oh, I want to see if I can do that. Like, I just want to do this for fun and for um, hmm, satisfaction. Yeah. But, well, but then you end up going to SUNY Purchase to study it uh, pretty seriously. What, what do you think? Mm. Um, I've heard there's a great program up there for, oh, for yeah. music. What, what were you able to take away from a formal education in music that you wouldn't have otherwise had if you were just kind of autodidactic? You know, I think like uh, the curriculum at SUNY Purchase that I was a part of is called Studio Composition. It's sort of like a mix of like ear training and theory songwriting and production and you kind of get out of it whatever you put into it you know um and i <laughs> uh, i feel the same way uh about you know my time at at purchase as i do kind of about like the piano lessons i took for a year in like elementary school i'm like oh, i wish I, I i wish i could go back and like take my my young self and be like listen <laughs> I know more of this like focus because later you'll be glad that you did um so like i mean i definitely learned things in the program there but i think maybe the most valuable thing that i took away from it was the working relationships that like you know mm. uh, there are people i met at college um in the program that i still collaborate with i mean the the guy that i made my first three records with, you know, we met at school and we made the first record that I ever made and that he ever produced uh, in Studio A at Purchase. Um, and there are people, you know, the lifelong friends that, that I still write with and collaborate with in a variety of ways. So like being in that sort of community setting um, that was entirely music focused was, was really, I think, invaluable. You know that you've officially made it to middle age when you start dreaming about being able to go back to just go to school for six months at a time. Like, I know yeah, that's what exactly. happened to me. I'm like, man, if I could just go and sit in a place for six months and not think about anything except for learning, like that. Yeah, just... Wow, <laughs> the dream. <laughs> that's the dream. And we had it. But yes. We, no. And, and we were dreaming about other things at the time. That that was the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What well, what talk to me about that first record that you made there though, because that ends up becoming your debut. That ends up becoming the, um, you know, the the starting point for the artistic career that we know you on um, now. What was it like making that record? And did you know that you were making something that would officially be the start of something, or did it just feel like you were, um, almost demoing at the time? Yeah. I mean, I think like. I would imagine that you or like anybody who <laughs> has had a life, you know, making songs and making records and stuff uh, could relate. No, I, I feel like nothing ever feels like I'm like, yes, <laughs> nothing has ever felt like. And now I'm doing this thing and I can see a clear line in the sand that I'm, you know, stepping over this threshold into the next stage of my musical existence. Yeah. Um, we were just kind of like, uh grabbing you know pockets of time here and there wherever we could and you know uh, dan romer is, is the guy who produced the record um who i you know became very close with at school and we were just uh two friends uh trying to make some recordings of some songs and and you know we had both been going to school you know he was in the production program and i was in the the studio comp program and so we were both kind of like doing the thing or it was kind of like you know a thesis like doing the thing to prove that you learned the stuff you came to learn yeah you know um and i was at the time that we finished i was i had graduated and i was working at a record label uh called shanaki that uh was serendipitously based in my hometown of is that uh, like a folk Missouri. record is it, it like sh uh, yes, okay exactly yeah. exactly yeah. yeah yeah um they sort of like began as a celtic label and then kind of like became one of the first importers of reggae in like the 80s into the uh -huh. u.s and then by the time i was working there uh smooth jazz was a big like celtic music <laughs> and smooth jazz were the the and then they had the yazoo sub label which is all sort of like old delta blues the the president yes. of the label was a big 78 collector and and was like really into uh you know getting needle drops <laughs> uh right. on his pristine 78s and uh you know putting out charlie Patton records and stuff uh so so i had um 
uh, graduated, I was working uh, at Shanaki, and then on weekends or nights or whatever, I would like drive up to purchase, and we would we would um, cut a vocal or get some drums or whatever. And then when it was all done, um, I went through <laughs> through Shanaki to our manufacturer, and they yeah. you know uh, pressed up some CDs for me, which rocked. And then I started playing shows, uh, or mm-hmm. I was you know still playing shows. I was continued to play shows but somehow it felt more real because all of a sudden i had a cd CD. yeah um and then you know a convergence of uh like very cool things all happened at once uh somebody from a label called network reached out to me on myspace if you've ever heard of it (laughs) oh have i heard have i heard Uh, uh, i used to curate my top eight friends pretty seriously jenny so. It's. I mean, it's. Uh, it's. Well, lost to the haze of memory and time, but it, it was once a very serious yeah. thing. You can mess around with your top eight. Um, Joe, can you forgive me, my my dog? You're good. You're totally good. Uh, let me just. Okay. Oh, buddy, come on, man. I live in an old house and my door, my studio door does not quite latch all the way. So I put a weight in front of it, a 10 pound weight. And my dog, who is only 30 pounds, uh, without fail, will just bust in like Vince McMahon, you know. Pound for pound. Shoulders. Exactly. Yeah, sorry. he can really move it. That's awesome. Uh, some chaos in here. Okay, sorry. Uh, right. No, you're good. So, but basically, it, what you're kind of describing is is this this thing kind of taking on a, a life of its own. Like you've made something, you're obviously proud enough of it to, you know, to commit it to to a record and to a CD. But um, it sounds like there's just at a certain point, kind of a momentum starts to, to take off that uh, that helps you push the ball forward. That helps you push the ten pound weight away from yeah. the door and yourself <laughs> into the room. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think like when I look backwards at like any. I don't know, point in my personal timeline, I, my, the overwhelming feeling that I get is like, wow, I really got lucky there and there and there and there and there. It just feels like, um, uh, a lot of, a lot of of luck and, um, just like, you know, uh, being maybe in the right place at the right time or just, you know, trying to keep my head down and, and do the stuff, do the things, make, make, uh, make songs and, Hope that somebody wants to hear them, you know? Yes. It's it's a tough thing because there's two sides of the coin. One side of the coin is like, well, you know, I was lucky to be there at the time and I got these opportunities and that gave me a ticket to the show and that's great. But then the other hand of it is, you know, you think to yourself like, well, if I hadn't gotten it then, I really love doing this. So maybe I would have just kept on doing the damn thing until I did get it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, there's no way to know, but I think like the most valuable thing that anybody making music for any kind of like um career pursuit can like hold on to is the joy you know the reason remember the reason that you like started doing it in the first place because once you start making a living at something or try to start making a living at something it's so easy to lose track of why you wanted to do it in the first place because you know survive survival is is uh serious and and it can be really tough in i mean probably in any career path or discipline but like music is is tricky and and sticky um but if you want to be doing it then at least you still want to be doing it you know yeah well i mean i think on a very basic level it, it can be kind of depressing to commodify something that you love you know to turn yeah. it into a product which is what you're ultimately turning it into and I don't know. As I've gotten older, I've I've learned to find a way to love putting it into a product, like to make it to commodify it with love and, yeah, and yeah. intention. But I, I know certainly in my in my twenties and early thirties, I was just uniformly bummed out by that process. Yeah, it's. I think it's it's a tough thing to accept because when you are just doing it because you love it, you can't even conceive of of that aspect of being like a professional musician. Uh, And then once you're in it, there's like an ick factor, I think that you have to kind of like adapt to accept. And then if you can find a way, like you said, 
uh, to love it and to, to, you know, put the care and heart into that aspect of mm -hmm. music creation that you also put into making the songs and recording them, then you can stay happy. <laughs> Yeah. Or try. Yeah. Well, then you then you have a a Hershey's chocolate bar on on your hands. You know, just this perfect thing that goes out into the world and gives people joy all the time. You know, and and uh, it's hard to make that. I think we're all good at making you know homemade cookies in our house uh, that we can give to the neighbors. But you know, trying to make that thing that you can get to a lot of people that mm -hmm. is still genuine mm -hmm. uh, and gives people joy. I mean, that's a tough thing. That's a tough thing to arrive at. Yeah, I mean, I think once you start, once you start thinking about, once you luck into some kind of exposure, and once you start to experience other people experiencing your songs, it changes your experience or can change your experience of making songs in the future. You're like, oh, how do I recapture? What would a songwriter do right now? Right. <laughs> what would somebody who really meant this do? Yes. Uh, it's tricky. It's tricky. Well, and so you had the opportunity to to run into these problems because you 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 signed with Network, and mm. then you start uh, you start an artist career uh, of your own. What what did that look like? Were you you were certainly touring to a certain degree because you like I mentioned before you were on that uh, revival tour. You mm -hmm. toured a bunch with Regina Spector. What did those years look like early yeah. on? Um. Well, it was pretty zany. Uh, not a lot of sleep. Uh, <laughs> just running around. Uh, I somehow. The folks at Shanaki were so amazing that I could, you know, work for some months and then go on tour for some months. Uh, they were like very supportive. So I was able to have like sort of a thread of, um, you know, um, some kind of foundational <laughs> income situation, uh, which felt uh, like a bit of security, which was really nice. Yeah. And, you know, I was just doing and if what felt like endless loops around the United States and then over to uh, the UK and mainland Europe um, just kind of like it felt it felt nonstop <laughs> it felt nonstop and it was like very exciting and awesome and um, it's another thing that I wish I could like go back and be like hey I think you could past me uh, be doing even more to like enjoy this and appreciate it while it's happening you know yes. I think like it's uh, hard to be present, and also you know, who among us, <laughs> like who among us, doesn't want to like redo a bunch of stuff? Uh, yes. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I, well, one of the things I'd say to my past self is like, why don't we try drinking just half a bottle of whiskey per night and not a full <laughs> bottle of whiskey? <laughs> just start there. Can you start Moderation? there? And then sure, the yeah. other, but like what you're mentioning there, like that. That feeling of it feels like I'm on the road all the time. Hmm. I think the reason that that can be very tiring, especially at that age, is because you project out and you go, oh, wow, I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. I'm just going to be on the road 200 days a year. And what you don't realize is you're probably not going to be on the road yeah. 200 days a year for the rest <laughs> of your life. You know what I mean? It's like this really intense period at the start. Um, and I mean, I wish I just had known that then it's just like, dude, you got to just hold on for about seven years. And after the yeah, seven yeah. years, things will chill out a little bit. You yeah, know? yeah. That'll be kind of a light at the end of the tunnel of sorts or like a couch, a bed at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, um, but did you, uh, do you remember, do you remember a particular highlight show? Like as you're playing and it's kind of crazy and uh, very tiring, but um, do you remember a particular show where you thought to yourself, like, wow, I'm doing the damn thing right now and it, it might be working? Hmm. Um, what a great question. I think, like, I think, um, well, uh, you had mentioned Regina Spector, who I, I did some, like, shows in the Northeast, like, early on, like, in 2006. Mm -hmm. um so early for regina and super early for me uh and then i went to europe with her in 2009 and like those were she just has like such an incredible audience and like yeah. they're i'm sure you know <laughs> like really well that like there's um you know your headline shows which are like your 
thing and you're in the center and the people who come are, you know, they're already on your side. But like yes. playing for an audience of people that I think like don't know anything about you, but they're but they're the kind of audience maybe like I feel like Regina's audience is like a very open, you know, and and mm -hmm. stoked. And that's like, you know, not always the case. Uh, I, I can remember this like show in Manchester from that 2009 run that was like so bonkers. It was just sort of like th such a direct connection mm. uh, to people. And then I like went, to, I was like at merch for like ever because yeah. uh, you know, uh, when you feel that other people feel it, you know, and, and then, and then you get to say hi and, and it's really cool. Um, I think that was that sticks out in my mind as like a really special like oh wow this is like the the level of connection to which i aspire you know and yes. it just happened and that rocks you do need a receptive audience though and not all artists have receptive audiences for I, what you don't want is an audience of me because if i go to see a band and some person <laughs> i didn't expect to be there some dude <laughs> or chick gets on stage with an acoustic guitar i immediately want to uh, you know, fall on my sword. And but, so you want people who are, who are open to it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've done tours where uh, we're in theaters and audiences are just dialed in and you're like, man, I just made a fan out of everybody here tonight. And then I've done tours where it's like, I start the tour, I got a month to go. And mm -hmm. I just know from day one, like no one in this audience nationally is going to give a shit about what I do. And that's fine. That's totally fine. <laughs> it's just a bummer that I have to be here every night now yeah, <laughs> to yeah. have that reinforced. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but sometimes, you know, sometimes you think that's what you're getting into. And then it's not like, like the very first night that I did a show on the revival tour, which like for anybody listening, who's not familiar, it's, it's sort of a collaborative, tour put together by uh, Chuck Reagan from Hot Water Music. And a lot of the rotating cast of songwriters are, are um, you know, like Tim Berry from Avail and um, like fo folks from punk and hardcore and like really intense bands uh, that yeah. I wouldn't necessarily have ever expected to get pulled into. Um, and the first night that I joined the tour, I like was looking around the room before I got on stage and there were like, um, I mean, it was, it feels like my, my memory feels like a cartoon because it was just like uh, studded leather jackets and mohawks and just like everyone with like, you know, full body tattoos. And I was like, oh no, uh, they're gonna hate me or at least wonder what I'm doing here. How did I end up on this tour? I'm so scared. And then I got on stage and received like one of the warmest, like most supportive audience responses to my set that that I can remember in the whole revival tour felt like that. And I think that that like is a in I think that has a lot to do with with Chuck's energy in particular. You know, he's such a warm, giving, welcoming, open person. Um, and the fact that like and the fact that he has found a way to to pull all of these people together from these various bands that have like a much more, you know, rowdy uh perhaps uh chaotic or perhaps uh aggressive or just fucking loud <laughs> yeah kind of thing and and in, infuse it with his sort of like warm heartedness and like make it this sort of like campfirey we're all in this together feeling is just like i mean it's just like so chuck <laughs> it's just yeah like this chuck thing but at the time i didn't know that at the time i thought oh no everyone's gonna hate this I know, but that's why, well, they say, like, when there's an upset in football, they always go, well, that's why they play, that's why they actually play the games. And that's why you actually go out and play the shows. You know what I mean? Like, you gotta, yeah, yeah. you you know, it's it's really cool that you were able to discover that. But to discover that, you had to put yourself in a very vulnerable, sounds like kind of scary situation for a second. I think, like, I just think, like, uh, making a life of music is is sort of like, it requires us to put ourselves in vulnerable situation after vulnerable situation. You have to constantly be seeking this place of vulnerability. And also like you have to accept there's just a certain level of 
like baseline humiliation that could occur <laughs> at any time in any aspect of your day to day life. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you can get over the hump of accepting <laughs> that, then <laughs> then you have a shot of like continuing. But <sighs> but it is it is like a funny aspect that I, I think <laughs> I spent a lot of time thinking about. And that's hard to explain to people who don't work in some kind of creative field <laughs> you know you just genuinely cracked me up in a way i haven't been cracked up in a while um <laughs> Are you stuck in a rut? Are you tired of listening to that Jimmy Buffett 20th Century Masters CD over and over again and need some new music? Are you sick of making hamburger helper beef stroganoff for dinner every night and you want something new to cook? What you are looking for, my friends, is the Enthusiast Digest. That's my monthly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox the first Sunday morning of every month, bursting with musical recommendations, poetry selections, recipes and cooking techniques for my favorite dishes, and items of general interest culled from the vast cesspool that is the Internet. The Enthusiast Digest is free to subscribe to. If you dig the poetry that you hear on this show and the artists that you're hearing from, you'll dig the newsletter because I approach it with the exact same sensibility of curation. Go to joepugmusic.com slash newsletter today to sign up for free. That is joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. It takes approximately 15 seconds to sign up for a free newsletter that will enrich the first Sunday of your month with a veritable cornucopia of new and delightful recommendations. That's the Enthusiast Digest, the first Sunday of every month. Sign up for free at joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. It was hard not to ruefully laugh at Jenny's description of the entertainment business having a baseline level of humiliation. And acknowledging that reality can often make you cynical. On my worst days, that's where I'm at. But there's something that keeps on bringing me back, that keeps on bringing Jenny back, that keeps on bringing back all of the artists we've hosted here on this show. It's a sense of hope and it's an intuition that all things considered, this is worth doing rather than not doing. And there's a wonderful poem by Joseph Mills that speaks to this. It's entitled, We've Had This Conversation Before. We've had this conversation before, my daughter and I, many times, about what she might buy with her allowance, about candy, about how her brother annoys her, about where her birth mother might be. And we've had this conversation before, my son and I, many times, about how fast he is, how fast horses are, about candy, about how his sister bosses him, about how much a horse costs. And we've had this conversation before, my wife and I, many times, about how tired we are, about what we might buy them and how much it all costs, about how they annoy us, how fast they're growing, how scared we are about what might happen about this life, this life so tiring and wonderful, and how, if we could, we'd repeat it, this life, many times, many times. Talk to me a bit about, you have this whole other part of your career that I think is very interesting um and in some ways unlikely given what your background was in that you you were able to write for and with like pretty mainstream in some cases pop acts and the reason i say it's kind of unlikely is many people who have artist careers um are are so idiosyncratic in their songwriting by definition that it can seem hard to go into that other world and write something that um 
can maybe be a little bit more accessible. So can you describe to me how you got into that world of writing for and with other people and um, in what ways it was different from working on your own artist career as a writer? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had just put out my third record and boy, was I, t- boy, were my arms tired. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I had like just done yet another loop around the country and, and was just sort of like, hmm. I was also like, I had just turned uh, 30 or 31. I like just entered my 30s and I was like having this weird sort of what is life kind of thing. And like, am I going to keep doing this? And then I like can't, I somehow wove through those question marks and got to oh i can do anything i want uh i'm an adult and i can just do whatever and right around the same time i started working um with uh, a manager uh who also managed a uh sort of uh musical artist turned songwriter i guess or like you know uh who remains both but like um he was managing uh, Dan Wilson, who uh, is of the band Semisonic, and then like has uh, you know become has has really crafted a career in helping other people make songs um, that is uh, very successful and impressive. And and uh, uh, our shared manager was like, "Hey, I think this is something you could be good at too." And I was like, "That sounds like giving up. That sounds like admitting defeat. That sounds like a bunch of nonsense." Um, but also i just decided i could do anything (laughs) so why don't i give it a try so i was living in new york at the time i flew to la i met dan we wrote and we you know he and um jim our our manager at the time um i guess we hatched a little plan and um dan was looking to do a joint publishing venture with uh the publisher was then known as Big Deal, now known as Hypnosis. And that company was founded by a guy named uh, Kenny McPherson, who rocks, who I was uh, signed with at Chrysalis, at the dawn of my uh, career as an artist. So dude, I loved running new publishing company um, and amazing songwriter Dan looking to start a joint venture and like, you know, bring on somebody to co-publish with Big Deal. And that sort of like, started this this process of me going to LA for two or three weeks every few months and just trying to like figure out how to write pop songs question mark with people and that went on for a couple years and then I just decided I, I was looking to get out of New York City and I was like why not just move across the country and see if this could really stick so I moved to LA and just started doing you know, even more sessions because I was just there all the time. And once you're in the place where there's a lot of that happening, it's uh, it just new doors kind of open, new opportunities. Oh, somebody dropped off this session last minute and you're in town now. Do you want to jump on it? Kind of thing. Uh, it's just a lot of cross pollination, a lot of trial and error, a lot of, you know, it's very being uh, a musician is like very social work, but my, my experience. Pr- prior to this was like, oh, go on tour, become best friends with 10 people for a month and then don't see them again for three years, you know? Whereas with songwriting, it's sort of like, okay, you are you have to find that place of vulnerability, become best friends with somebody and write a song by the end of the day, you know? And then maybe you'll see them again in a month and, and do it again kind of thing. So like getting into that rhythm um, was interesting i think like the way that i started out trying to think about i think a lot of people who don't make pop music come to it like oh pop music that's so dumb that'd be so easy it'd be so easy for me to make a top 40 smash ola and (laughs) cash in but i'm just i just have too much integrity to do that but the truth (laughs) is (laughs) that uh writing an awesome song that like everybody wants to sing along to is really really hard you already know that because you're already trying to do that with your own little songs <laughs> but trying to do it on a bigger scale uh is is even harder 
Uh, and I think like the the my my first sort of my first sort of approach was like, OK, pop music is just like a different language. So I have to like learn a new language and then like translate things that are interesting to me into a new language. And I don't know how well that theory has held has held up. I think like the longer I do it, the more songs I write, the more I'm just like, it just has to be cool to me. Like it has to be something that I want to be writing. It can't be something that I think somebody else wants to hear. Kind of similar to after somebody hears, you know, your song and they're like, oh, I like this. And then you're like, okay, no, I have to write another one yeah. and I have to make sure they like it. So what, how can I reverse engineer a yeah. quote, authentic song by me? Um, right. You know? Talk to me. I, I do want to drill down on something that you just mentioned there because it sounds interesting. Even if you're not continuing to use this paradigm now, uh, the idea of trying to translate into this language uh, of pop music that is its own language, again, even if you're not using that as the paradigm now, at the time, what did you imagine that language to be? What were some of the key verbs and nouns in that language that you were trying to that you were trying to um, translate your own stuff into? Hmm. It was sort of like. I don't know if I ever like found a good answer and maybe that's why it like stopped feeling like a useful tool to try to apply. But I, I think there's like, at the time I think I thought like, okay, it has to be streamlined. It has to be, I want to say simpler, but that, that sounds like, uh, like reductive, you know, like, but how do you chase that? <laughs> it's like once you start putting the word accessibility into your thought process about making a song, I think you're already kind of cutting yourself off at the knees, you know. But um, there are definitely there. Are, it definitely feels like well, everybody has their own rules. But I think like one of the things that I bumped up a lot against was like people would be like, "Oh, you can't put that word in a song," like, like everybody doesn't know what that word means or like that's a regional thing or that is you know too obscure or has you know too many syllables or not enough so you know like the way that like everybody everybody in a session i think feels like they know what you can't say you know what i mean which yeah. which is which is good and useful and awesome <laughs> I think I'm kind of like yeah. uh, walking in a a spiral towards the center of something, but I don't know if I'm ever going to get there, Joe. <laughs> no, no, no you're, that that makes sense. Um, it's what were some what were some skills then that you had to to quickly improve at when you got there? Because obviously, it sounds like this process is vastly different than what you were doing for writing for your artist career. All of a sudden, you're out there with Dan Wilson and. Like when you're in the room with someone like that and, and working together, what was something that you thought to yourself early on, like, I got to get better at this, or this is something that I have to improve on if I want to, you know, make meaningful work with other people in this world? Yeah, I think like the, I think maybe without a doubt, the most important thing that I've learned to reach for and cultivate that I think anybody who's looking to, to collaborate, um, should think about if it's something that they have like um a hard time doing it's okay everybody has bad ideas or everybody has an idea that doesn't make it into the song you know what i mean or that doesn't resonate with the room right but the number of times that i have um said something that didn't work that sparked something in somebody else's brain like, oh, not that, but this, and that ping pongs to somebody else. And they're like, okay, but but flip it, and then we'll do it like this. And then we get someplace amazing. Like, everyone being in the room and participating is, like, so valuable. Because if you don't say, if you don't say your ideas, then you don't give anybody else in the room the opportunity to take them in, consider them, maybe flip them, twist them, or get inspired in a different direction by them. You know, like, it's it's 
forcing yourself into that place of vulnerability where you're like, I'm going to say my idea, even though, you know, maybe I don't think it's the right thing, but it's just like, it's what's in my brain right now. It's like what I'm being moved yeah. to say or think about by what just happened. Uh, you have to let your links in the sort of like chain reaction of making the song yeah. exist. Otherwise, you're doing a disservice to the room and to the song in progress. Sure. You know? Well, yeah, and it's not like once you get to a good idea, people go back afterwards forensically and say, and let's not forget that stupid fucking idea that Jenny had that started all, you know what I mean? Like, but, but, you know, it, the part of us that does feel vulnerable and weird, like there, there is some, you know, like uh nightmare scenario where that happens, but of course it never happened, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to kick you out for your bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, or, or you know what it makes me think of is, uh, you remember in the movie Happy Gilmore when he gives uh, an answer and, and the uh, in the quiz show, and the quiz show guy says, uh, what you just said is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Everyone in this room is dumber for having now heard it. May God have mercy on your soul. Like, so. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, my God, yeah. How, exactly. um, what was something that when you came into that world, um, you noticed immediately you were like, actually, th this is a quality of mine creatively that um, is really good that I can bring to the table. I, I excel in this part of the process mm -hmm. and it can help rooms when I'm in there. I think like, it's funny, I wasn't expecting this when I got into session writing, but like, the, like there are people who, there's so many people who love to make tracks and so many people who love to write melodies but it's harder to find people who are like really lyric focused so mm. just like having you know an interest you know like being really invested in lyrics i think has been helpful because sometimes when you know your publisher is putting together a room they're like okay we have a track person a melody person but we need a lyric person and mm. and that has like served me um and the other, th the, the thing that like I try to, <laughs> revealing my, revealing my secrets to my <laughs> potential future victims, yeah. uh, a thing that I love to do in rooms is just get people to talk about themselves because I think like that's, you know, A, you're, you have to, you're, you're on like um, a super fast forward best friend uh, sort of timeline where you have to like feel close to people to make something cool together. Uh, so like really getting everyone kind of participating in a conversation about like what's going on in your life, what what is hurting you right now, or like what's awesome, or like just what's going on. Trying to, to pull those things out of people to create an atmosphere in the room of, of uh, people being like ready to, to share and to be maybe in like a slightly more raw place than they were when they first walked in the door. Mm. That is a thing that I try to do. Mm -hmm. are, are you able to volunteer that same kind of information yourself? Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, you gotta be in it to win it. I don't think that yeah. applies, gotta, but you know what I mean? <laughs> you gotta, skin in the game. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's only fair. Um, we're all sharing <laughs> and that's the yeah. idea. Yeah. That, what have you taken from this um, process, this way of writing songs, and brought back into your own process for writing songs on the artist side? Mm. I think like kind of similar, wow, everything's connected. Similar to my experience at school, I think uh, one of the most important things that I've taken is is just meeting so many people and, and uh, collaborating with so many people and being able to kind of survey that uh, vast landscape of musical buddies that I have accumulated to be like, oh, I think this person would be awesome to try to write a song for me with. Um, yes. And also just like uh, visiting endless home studios and being like oh so this is a piece of gear that would fix, uh. <laughs> fix my life and help me write a million songs very cool uh and also just like watching other people work like uh observing other people's uh processes um both on the sort of like production side and also just like 
getting to know how other people approach lyric and melody, you know, just taking all of that. I, I, I think like, uh, I think of writing sessions too, as like, just like a very rich place to learn from all these other people who are, who are doing it their own way. You know, there's like no two people do it the same way. <laughs> that is for sure. Yeah. And no, pe no two people get hung up on the same things. I, I've never yeah. co-written a ton, but I've worked with a lot of different producers. And one of the things that helps me the most is if I'm working in my own recording process, inevitably there'll be something with a song or something on the production end that I get hung up on. And inevitably when you go to work with someone else, like that's not a thing that they're hung up about at all. They don't even pay attention to that. And they just blow through it. And it kind of yeah. gives you permission to blow through it as well. Yeah, yeah. I think that is also invaluable like um you can be so hung up on something and just be like really tornadoing on the inside about it just like oh my god this thing, oh my god the way that it sounds when i say this like one vowel sound or whatever oh god it's terrible and then you get in a room with somebody else who's like tuned into so many other details of what's going on and they're like i didn't even notice that like that's right get out of your head just get out of your head Right, right, right. Or, and then, of course, the uh, the opposite can happen where you're focused on, you're like, man, listen to the way I, I turn this phrase here. And they're like, that's cool. That phrase is cool. But the whole song sucks. <laughs> so you're yeah. kind of missing the forest for the trees here. Yes, yes. It's not interesting at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the gift and curse of objectivity from an outside <laughs> source. Do you... Um, uh, do you project out and, and have a vision for what you'd like to be doing artistically um, in kind of like a, a grander scheme going forward? Or or do you, are you still just take it day to day as an artist? And this is the session I'm doing today. And we're going to do that and try to do it the best. Uh, do you have an overall plan? Um, I have like, this is a very weird thing to say. I have like the next two years kind of like mapped out more or less of like things I want to hit. <clears throat> um projects that I'm working on and uh, deadlines that must be met so that releases can exist. But yeah. uh, but there's plenty of room, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to put a record out next year and then I'd like to be like writing a record. Like the the how of the writing the next record is a blank page that has yet to be kind of like shaded in and stuff. But like I have timelines and other, other projects kicking around. Um, I'm about to... I just, um, as you mentioned, I like make some podcasts yeah. and uh, the the Buffy, the Vampire Slayer podcast that I've been making uh, for the last six years and writing a song for every episode as we go, we just taped our finale. Oh, wow. I have, I've reached a strange, uh, very strange pause moment in my life in that department. But my co-host and I um, have uh, sold a book that we now <laughs> have to write. So like... Uh, while I'm, you know, not writing songs for myself, making my own records, writing songs for other people or making a podcast, I guess I'm going to try to write a book and hopefully succeed knocking on all the wood. You know, I feel really bad for you there, Jenny, because as songwriters who also do podcasts, what you're losing with the podcast leaving, there's nothing that is a better excuse to not write a song. <laughs> They say, I got to do something with the podcast right now. Like it is my, it is an excuse that I treasure. It's like my golden baby that I keep yeah. because I'm like, oh, I can't write a song today. I got to. <laughs> so sorry, guys. I, I, I got to edit audio today. I, yes. you know, what do you want from me? Um, I got to talk to, to Jenny Owen Youngs today. I can't write a fucking song. <laughs> um, well, that's really cool. It's, um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I think you've carved out such a, uh, just brilliant and, um, uh, unique career. I, I just, looking at it from afar it's just such a beautiful thing to see so uh thanks for being you and, and thanks for being on the show <laughs> uh thank you so much for having me it's been such a pleasure to talk to you also your voice is like so soothing i feel well thank you you should hear me yell at my children it's a very I... <laughs> different it's a very different voice at that point This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. 
Jenny Owen Young's latest album is entitled It's Dangerous to Go Alone, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.